So our next speaker up is actually Aggie class of 87. We were so thrilled this year to welcome back to campus um, Dr. Melinda Sheffield-Moore, who's the new department head of health and kinesiology. Please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Thank you. Howdy, Ags. Wow, what a wonderful community event to be held uh, on Texas A&M campus. And the fact that we have partners from all over the state really is, uh, speaks volumes to the, uh, the work that Dr. Lightfoot has done. And of course, with uh, the generosity of the uh, Huffines Institute and the Hilliard family, we are able to bring together a wonderful group of scientists to talk about um, such fun topics. And, Today I'm going to talk to you more about a fun topic that came out of my lab, and it's called Aging Skeletal Muscle and the Little Blue Pill. So when Dr. Lightfoot asked me to do this talk, I thought a TED talk, wow, that's a, that's a tough one. And um, because we as scientists, when we develop our talks, we, we give ourselves little triggers throughout our talk so we know exactly what we want to disseminate to you as, uh, as our audience. And, um, I was really struggling with how to do this, and I thought I could just do a stand-up comedy routine because that would be a really neat thing to do. And when I uh, was looking through the American Association for the Academy of Sciences meeting that I'm going to go to in March, I saw an interesting session, and it was called um, Science Comedy Night, and it was a special session that they were going to be offering, and I thought, well, that's really cool. So I thought I would at least, if nothing else, try to have a little bit of a, a true more TED TED Talk type environment. But unfortunately, I'm talking about science, and science is a little bit of a tough sell sometimes and difficult to make funny. Comedians are really good at, at, um, at what they do because of their delivery, but they're also really good because they have fantastic material. So I tried to, fit, uh, to pick some science that I do in my lab that's maybe a little lighter and a little fun, more fun. So let's see how this goes. So, one thing that isn't so funny is the fact that we're really um, facing what, we, what I would consider to be a global healthcare crisis. And this crisis is a disability crisis. And it, and it stems from the fact that we have um, a rapidly growing population that is aging. And the estimates are that in, by 2050, that individuals um, over 65 will account for, I think, 25% of the population and they will double, and individuals 80 and older will go from approximately, I believe the numbers are 10 million individuals to 30 million individuals. So if you look at this little cartoon, you see our baby boomers, um, everybody else is flowing into the emergency room in a normal size, uh, in a more normal size ambulance, but the baby boomers are gonna come rushing to the doors of our healthcare system, and we're not prepared for that. And so today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about how we can reduce things like mobility disability and medical disability by being physically active and how physical activity is um, throughout our lifespan is our friend, but that when we reach sort of this metabolic tipping point in, in, the, in times of illness or chronic disease, that perhaps we may not have that luxury of exercise. And so what can we do in order to prevent um, this disability crisis. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of this behind-the-scenes work that's going on in science. So skeletal muscle dysfunction associated with aging is um, associated with a number of different factors. But the one factor that I want to drive home today is that it's primarily associated with inactivity. And if you look at this, uh, at this um, depiction here, you can see that inflammation, oxidative stress, inactivity, um, anabolic resistance of skeletal muscle that occurs with aging, all of these things can lead to something that we refer to as the sarcopenia of aging. And all that really means is the loss of muscle mass and physical function associated with age. And as you can see, inactivity, the bar that goes to inactivity sort of feeds to the sarcopenia, this loss of muscle mass and loss of physical function. And one of the aspects of this that occurs with aging and chronic diseases where we become disabled has to do with skeletal muscle fatigue or just generalized fatigue. And I have a colleague that was in my lab that was very interested in the role of fatigue in disability. And so 
Um, as I said before, when we reach that sort of metabolic tipping point, if you will, and we don't have the opportunity to exercise um, as a means to prevent disability, to prevent sarcopenia, we as scientists are implored to come up with alternative strategies to help uh, society uh, prevent from having this disability crisis. So why is it important? Why do we need to maintain our skeletal muscle health um, as we age? Well, I've listed about five or six points here that are critical to my argument. Um, but implicit in this is that we obviously want to maintain an independent living style. We want to keep our muscle strength. We don't want to be fatigued and feel, um, uh, you know, feel bad. We don't want to trip over our own feet and break a hip. And um, we want to have a good quality of life. And we also don't want to add burden to, um, to the medical community by being inactive. And many of these other things that, that come about with inactivity, like obesity and other metabolic disorders, all lead us down that path of chronic disability um, or even things like acute illness. And these things are the things that put us over that functional or metabolic tipping point that can um, put, us in, in, put us in the hospital. This, this shows just basically a depiction of the fact that there's a couple ways that we can manage our muscle mass. So we can grow muscle mass, we know, nutritionally, with androgens such as testosterone, exercise, and blood flow. And skeletal muscle is this tremendous reservoir of amino acids and proteins that is very um, selfless when it comes to giving up these amino acid and proteins in times of need. And so what happens is, is that we're, when we're inactive or we fail to eat, so we're fasting, or we become inflamed because we're older and we become arthritic, um, or if we get a chronic disease such as cancer, where we have tumor factors, those are the factors that will cause our muscle to break down. And as I said, it's a very selfless tissue, but it's a tremendous reservoir of amino acids for us. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, a particular way that, that we believe that enhancing blood flow by a process of uh, using a pharmacologic agent will help us mediate nitric oxide and grow skeletal muscle. So when you get tipped over in this little metabolic tipping point I keep referring to, um, there's not that many alternative strategies. So apart from, from exercise, we really have um, no other approved pharmacologic therapies to help us. And so NASA, my group participated in the 70-day bed rest study where we put healthy guys to bed for 70 days and we had some strategies to try to prevent them from losing muscle. And one of the things that NASA has done is develop this uh, vertical treadmill. But when you and I go into the hospital for 70 days or seven days, we don't have the luxury of having this phenomenal treadmill that allows us to remain supine and, and keep our muscles working as we're ill. So unfortunately, we're stuck with coming up with some alternative strategies. And as I mentioned to you before, Viagra or blood flow is one of those ways that um, we felt like might be a good way to grow skeletal muscle because there was some evidence with Viagra that um, it reduced fatigue. There was also some evidence from our laboratory and others that blood flow was stimulatory to skeletal muscle. So Viagra works because it, it, is, um, it works through a nitric, nitric oxide mediated signaling process in skeletal muscle. And by doing that, it vasodilates our, our vessels in our, like our capillaries in our skeletal muscle. And it opens things up allowing for addi additional nutrients and things to be delivered to the muscle which helps it then grow. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about a little bit of serendipity that has occurred in my lab. And when we first started this Viagra study, um, we were really just interested in its ability to um, uh, sort of mute fatigue that's associated with aging. And this was a very short acute study. It's a placebo-controlled, randomized study in younger men and older men. And we started with the lowest um, approved dose of Viagra, or sildenafil. And um, what we did was we gave it once a day to these older and younger men, 
and we measure things like muscle performance with isokinetic, isometric strength, um, standard fatigue protocols on an isometric um, leg extension machine. But we also decided, um, fortuitously, I might add, to measure muscle protein synthesis, because muscle protein synthesis, I'm a muscle metabolism person, and, and that's one of the common things that we do as part of our, our clinical trials. But it's also one of the more difficult things that we do, and one of the more costly things that we do. And this was just supposed to be a proof of concept study to see if Viagra could reduce fatigue, because we know that fatigue is one of the primary debilitating symptoms of chronic diseases, such as cancer but also as a debilitating process in the normal process of aging. So we did the muscle performance measurements as well as um, in the end we looked at some muscle proteomic uh, data and I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about that. So this is where the serendipity begins to creep in. Yay, we showed that Viagra, when we look at um, skeletal muscle uh, um, um, fatigue testing, Viagra is capable of uh, compared to placebo, is capable of having individuals or allowing individuals to produce more repetitions in a leg extension exercise. Okay, proof of concept, yay, we're there, way to go. But that's kind of boring. And we had already infused the isotopes, so we'd already incurred the cost. We had already um, decided that, you know, we would, uh, let's just go ahead and measure and see what happens with muscle growth. No expectation whatsoever. And the serendipity of this study is that we went ahead and measured this, put it on the mass spec, ground up the muscle, put it on the mass spec, and lo and behold, um, my, my colleague, Dr. Bill Durham, got these results showing that the fractional synthetic rate or the muscle protein synthetic rate of skeletal muscle was greatly increased in response to seven days of Viagra at the lowest dose. We didn't believe the results, so we went back and we measured them again. And then we had a lab meeting, and we talked about it and said, this can't be true, and we measured them again. These are levels of protein synthesis that equate to um, e even more than what we would see if I gave testosterone to a male acutely and looked at muscle growth. And so we got super excited, but we still didn't believe the results. So I sent them to a colleague of mine who, does, uh, who runs a proteomic core lab at the University of Texas Medical <coughs> Branch. And he ran, some proteomic, he ran some proteomics for me, looking at abundance and nitrosylation. Because remember, I said that, that Viagra works as a nitric oxide-mediated signaling process in skeletal muscle. And so we, want, we were not only interested in total abundance, but we were interested in the nitrosylation. And we wanted to know which of these key growth pathways in skeletal muscle were involved, with, uh, were affected because of... Um, Viagra. And what we see is, is that Viagra is actually capable of remodeling skeletal muscle in a very functionally adaptive way. And what that means is, is that when we look at the, um, the pathways that are most affected, those pathways are things like muscle development, the, the makeup or the um, morphology of the muscle, things like that. So these proteomic results confirmed what we saw with our mass spec results and also confirmed what we saw with our fatigue results. So what we now have is serendipity in the little blue pill. We have Viagra's ability to reduce skeletal muscle fatigue, we have its ability to stimulate muscle growth in humans, and to remodel the skeletal muscle proteome. This makes it a viable pharmacologic intervention for individuals who maybe are hospitalized and are unable to, be, um, to utilize exercise or a vertical treadmill to um, stimulate muscle growth and to prevent disability and muscle loss. So this unexpected road means that essentially our, my moral of my story is, is that the next time that um, you, know, you should stay healthy and, and fit and exercise throughout your lifespan, but the next time that someone you know takes Viagra, my guess is that you're not gonna be thinking about sex. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sheffield Moore. Certainly. We, uh, the phone is starting to light up here. Uh, the first one we got, and please t tell me your name and where you're from so I can give you credit. This uh, is coming in uh, several times. Are you now worried about Viagra being used as a, as a performance enhancing drug? 
I think uh, Viagra, the athletes are way ahead of us in, in, this, uh, in this field. Um, I think Viagra probably is already being used as a performance enhancing drug. It, the, sci the, the athletes are usually well ahead of the scientists in this department. So yes, I'm worried about that, but that doesn't prevent me from wanting to sort of help society as a whole and to prevent disability. So the athletes can do what they need to do and, and um, the rest of us will still work towards helping overall society, others. others. Uh, there was a question that came in earlier, and I, I wanted to get to it. Let me, excuse me while I page to it. I forgot to mention that while you're paging to it, um, we're gonna, we, I was supposed to say the word penis, sex, erectile dysfunction, and several other things, and then you were supposed to count how many times I said them, and then Tim, Dr. Lightfoot, was going to give you a prize if you could give me exactly how many times I said those things. But if you, man if you noticed, I managed to give my talk without saying anything but sex at the very end. So. Too late for that party. <laughs> um, okay, this is from Arash Bandigan. And given what you just said, and he's from uh, Western University, uh, especially if you're talking about helping frail older individuals, what do you recommend as a non-invasive surrogate approach to measuring muscle protein degradation in frail patients in place of muscle biopsies? So if that's the population you're working with. Well, so if I understand what he's asking, we've done this in spaceflight uh, years ago, even with John Glenn, we had a study where we used an isotope, um, uh, an isotope drink that then we can um, collect um, blood and or urine to be able to measure and model uh, muscle, protein, muscle protein breakdown. So we've done some of those studies in spaceflight already because in spaceflight we, we really don't have the opportunity to take muscle biopsy. So that's a great question. I've gotten this question three times from unattributed sources, so we're going to ask this question. How would Viagra affect women in this case? So um, some of the results that I can't talk about, um, because we have some intellectual property issues going on, or not issues, but some good things, um, are some of these future studies that we've already started. And we have put women on Viagra. And the number one question I get is, um, does it grow their muscle? I can't answer that yet. But number two is, um, do they uh, have a similar effect, uh, that it, does it have a similar effect on women that it has on men? And the answer is, Probably from a skeletal muscle standpoint, the answer is yes, but from a, um, a, an ability to desire more sex, the answer is no. So we don't have, it doesn't work um, in that same manner for women from a sexual but uh, it develops behavior muscle. standpoint. It, it, may, it may develop muscle. It may develop muscle. Excellent. We'll leave it with that. Right. We'll leave it at that. Please join me in thanking Dr. Sheffield Moore. Thank you.